Father, thank you for the time that you've given us to just study your word, to meditate on it, to think about it, to discuss it with one another, to share that, that common unity that we have in fellowship with you and with our Lord Jesus Christ, to, that we might grow in grace and knowledge of you. I just ask you to filter out all of that, which is foolish, but just seal to our hearts truth. It's in Christ's name I pray. Amen. Hi, this is Steve at BlessedHopeForever.com, and we are uh, just several, well, maybe hours away from uh, uh, one of the most exciting dates that I think we've come across in the past several years, and that is uh, Pentecost of 2021 at least according to Torah calendar, May 17, which I believe is Monday. This is Friday. This may be the last video I make before uh, we pass that marker. Uh, are we going to be raptured Monday? I have no idea. Uh, it's been my blessed hope uh, for the longest time that, that the Lord would take it and remove us from this earthly scene. And... Uh, uh, and do that in short order but uh, there's something interesting about the the timing of of all that and the, our present study in Philippians uh, given the fact that we're in chapter one and given the context of where we're at in chapter one you might find this video just a little bit interesting in light of all of that uh, I know I did and it's sort of a wake-up call I don't want to in the least bit, I don't want to uh, dampen uh, anyone's enthusiasm about our departure, uh, the Lord coming in and, and rescuing us uh, from our present uh, situation, the, the deliverance of our bodies. Uh, given the times that we're living with all of the uh, the chaos that's going on in, in the world and everything, uh, uh, it, it, I just find it interesting that we see Paul in a situation uh, which in which most of us would not want to find ourselves in. And of course, you know, we may not be going through the same things that Paul went through, but there there is there is without question a lesson in what we see in Paul here in the first chapter of Philippians. I know that there shall turn to my salvation through your prayer and the supply of the Spirit of Jesus Christ. I know that there shall turn to my salvation. Uh, this is verse 19. We're in chapter 1 verse 19 and I... I've spent some time just sort of hovering over this whole situation, trying to get a better picture of just what is what is truly going on and what I believe that the, the thought is that the Holy Spirit intended to convey uh, in these several verses, 19, 20, and 21, and 22. That's kind of where we're at in, in the first chapter here of Philippians. Uh now, most Bible students, well, they admit that Paul's not referring to his eternal redemption when he uses the word salvation. I know that there shall turn to my salvation through your prayer and the supply of the Spirit of Jesus Christ. Uh, salvation is not a synonym for redemption. Uh, uh, I remind you, you know, Timothy, take heed to doctrine, for in so doing thou shalt both save thyself and them that hear thee. And nobody would suggest that Timothy is not redeemed. And surely the word is not used there in the sense of redemption in verse 19. For I know that this will turn out for my deliverance. Uh, you know, that... No more than, than, than a wife could save or redeem her husband. In fact, we have scripture that says no man could even redeem his brother. Only Christ could pay the price of redemption. Uh, not very many times, if ever, does the Holy Spirit use the word salvation as a synonym of redemption. And so he's saying very confidently, 
I know absolutely that uh, because you're praying for me and because of the Holy Spirit, I'm going to be set free. I'm going to get out of prison. Is that what he's saying? And we don't have any valid proof of that. Uh, we don't know that Paul was ever set free. If, if he's using the word salvation here as his deliverance from prison, then either he was wrong and he made a mistake or he didn't mean that. That Paul would be delivered from the affliction added to his bonds by those preaching Christ out of envy and strife seems to fit the context. Not that, not that Rome will make his uh, imprisonment worse, but that the fact that there are brethren out there preaching the word of God from impure motives that are, that's causing Paul additional suffering or thinking to cause him additional affliction. Uh, that's what we're looking at. So I just want to really clarify what, uh, you know, I want to try to uh, draw or paint the clearest picture of what is going on here in the life of Paul, his relationship, as far as it regards his relationship with the Philippians. Uh, I, I want to try to it's been my intention to, to not rush over this, but to try to get a clear picture of just what exactly is going on and what is the lesson for us. That's, that's my intention. And I find the, the timing of this quite, quite interesting given the, the, the prophetic you know, nature of things. Uh, Now, I think, you don't have to agree with me, but I think that that's what the passage is saying. The Holy Spirit's confidence that Paul will be delivered from that additional affliction by the ministry of the Holy Spirit and the fellowship of believers in Christ. We need to fellowship together in the things of Christ. Deliverance from this added affliction is aided by our fellowship with one another. Uh, we tend to think of uh, salvation or deliverance, you know, ongoing salvation. I'm not talking about redemption, but ongoing salvation. We tend to think of that as a work of God in our lives. It's, it seems it's really, it doesn't have much to do with, with our relationship with one another. And I think that what we're going to see in the text is that it does. Uh, we're, we are able to comfort those who are in need with the comfort wherein we are comforted by God himself. We're to bear one another's burdens and so fulfill the law of Christ. Our text says, through your prayer and the supply of the spirit of Jesus Christ. Prayer, as in the worship of the Philippian believers to God. Uh, the Philippian believers that have it that, that which has a bearing on their fellowship with Paul. There are 12 words for prayer. Uh, you need to understand when we're looking at prayer, there are 12 different words. You look at the words for prayer, you'll see that the basis of all of that prayer is the worship of God. It's not requesting God, you know, uh, asking him to get your own way or to solve some particular nagging problem but the worship of god almighty for who he is for what he's done and what he's doing when i see the holy spirit speaking of our prayer and fellowship with god i think i think the, the concept of the word prayer fellowship worship uh it has it just had a lot to do with paul's deliverance from pressure okay the the word there is the pressure I think it had a lot to do with his deliverance from this affliction. It's hard to imagine, folks, a Paul who never needed anybody worshiping with him, never needed anybody praying for him, never needed anybody thinking about him. He was in prison, but he, even though Paul was in prison, he was in the hearts of the Philippians and they were in his. And we, folks, we are here. The reason we're here First and foremost, I mean, 
the, your whole reason for existing, you're, the reason you're here. Well, it's, it's so that Christ will be magnified in your body. But the reason you're here is for deliverance, the, the ongoing deliverance, deliverance in the presence of affliction. Okay, listen to me. The reason I am here in the body, in the flesh, is for deliverance in the presence of affliction. Or that's, that's, maybe I'm saying that wrong. Maybe that's, that's not. The reason I'm here is that Christ will be magnified in my body. But, but being that I am here, what is going to occur is that there's going to occur, uh, there's going to be deliverance in the presence of affliction. Deliverance in the, I'm trying to emphasize the importance of deliverance in the presence of affliction. We are going to be delivered in the presence of affliction the whole time we're here. It's, it's a big part of, of why we're here. So the way I'm reading this is as, as God in, in his love for us, his infinite love for us, his sovereignty and grace, it, his God's sovereignty, sovereignty his, his grace, his love for us, it allows us to work together in fellowship with each other and with the Holy Spirit. Not, not toward a, a hopeful possibility of redemption. Well, I hope I'm, I, I make it, you know, to heaven or, or whatever. God says that He's given us the Holy Spirit as the down payment of our inheritance. The Holy Spirit is leading us into all truth, and He's teaching us things to come. And He's in the Holy Spirit. His first and foremost primary concern is, is He's testifying of Christ, and that Holy Spirit that is the earnest. Okay, of our inheritance. And I wouldn't trade anything for it. The knowledge that I belong to God by means of the Lord Jesus Christ, that I have the assurance of glory that, that regardless of my life, God has provided for me in Christ Jesus. Wouldn't trade anything for that. And folks, I don't see any aspect of physical deliverance in the 19th verse. I think the deliverance that Paul is talking about is spiritual affliction by Christians, mind you, okay, from which he'll be delivered. These are those who are out preaching Christ, thinking to cause Paul distress. Uh, but they're doing it out of impure motives. So it's spiritual affliction by Christians from which he will be delivered. Let that sink in a minute. That's what we're seeing in the text. Not that Paul's circumstances or, or, or his affliction was going to change because of their act of worship in prayer. That's, that's not it. It's not that, that Paul's situation is going to change. If God works all things after the counsel of his own will, then there's not one of them I would want changed. Not a one. Nor one of them that God would allow to change. Or there's something wrong with this verse. If all things work together for my good, then I don't want anything changed because it wouldn't be for my good. Not hard for me to imagine that because of some uh, saint's difficult situation, hundreds of people are worshiping God in the supply of the Spirit. And this uh, worship, this worship, delivers us from any of the pressures, any of the difficulties, any of the, the, the spiritual pressures of, of the situation, whatever situation we're going through. I believe prayer changes attitudes. It may not change our circumstances, but it certainly changes our attitudes. We know that all prayer should be in accordance with God's will. We know this. And we know that God is working in us both the will and to do of his good pleasure. We worship God through prayer. The very thing that they thought would cause affliction in Paul's life did not. He's delivered from it. It is worship and the supply of the Spirit of Jesus Christ that makes all of the difficulty, all of the pressure, all of the situation, easy to bear. I don't think Paul is referring to his release from prison or his deliverance from death at the hands of Rome. 
We don't see any prayer requests here that Paul be set free. What we in fact are looking at is peace, rest, assurance, and hope in a situation that looks rather hopeless. It's clear that the Holy Spirit is revealing to us where Paul, my, Paul where his mind was in, in all that and where our mind ought to be. There's not one indication, not one, in this passage, this entire passage, that Paul or the Philippians in any ways suspect that God is out of control. Paul has an eager expectation and hope because his mind is settled on things above. Because his affection is on where Christ is seated at the right hand of the Father. Because he can see the finished work of the Lord Jesus Christ and God's purpose in all of this. According to my earnest expectation and my hope that in nothing, nothing, I shall be made ashamed but that with all boldness, as always, so now also Christ shall be magnified in my body, whether it be by life or by death, that in nothing shall I be made ashamed. Deliverance from what would be added affliction through prayer, worship, fellowship, the Spirit of Christ, the finished work of Christ. If that doesn't encompass the finished work of the Lord Jesus Christ, then I don't know what it would mean to be ashamed. You know, when somebody speaks of the, of the finished work of Christ, you, you'll hear that. You'll hear people use that phrase, the finished work of Christ. And, and, and uh, it's, you know, basically it's, oh, I believe Christ's work is finished. And then they preach and they, they act and live as though it's not. Folks, we are complete in Christ. He's given us all things that pertain unto life and godliness, that in nothing I shall be made ashamed. There is no deficiency in what Christ has done. I want you to think about what it, it means for a Christian to be ashamed. Okay? Is, is, is being ashamed as a Christian, is, is, is that to be ashamed as a Christian, does that mean that you failed uh, to perform adequately uh, in the flesh, that, that through the flesh, you know, through your own self-effort and your own self-will and your own determination and, and whatever else you want to throw into the, to the, to the mix, does, does, that, does that mean that uh, it's, uh, we're ashamed when we fail? to, let's say, you know, do everything that we're supposed to do. That is not what Paul is talking about. To be ashamed, like in the sense that Paul is talking about, is, is to, to live as though that there is a deficiency in what Christ has done, if you follow what I'm saying. And it's a passive voice. I'm not going to be made ashamed, but that with all boldness, okay, with all boldness, and the idea in the word boldness here is freedom of speech in public. If you want to look that up in the Greek, that's what you'll see. It, mean, it means freedom of speech in public, okay? Because primarily the, the word is used of freedom of speech in public. But Paul is in prison. Now, wait a minute. He's in prison. Well, but Paul's freedom of expression here is still public because 10,000 plus people were under the hearing of the Holy Spirit through Paul, okay? With all boldness, with all freedom of action and of speech, so that Christ shall be magnified in my person, whether I walk in this temple of clay or whether that temple of clay dies and I go to be with the Lord. Either way, Christ is going to be magnified. You know, Christianity as a whole looks forward to a day of judgment. We are clearly told by the Word of God that we do look forward to an accounting, not a day of judgment. There is no condemnation to those who are in Christ, but there, we do look forward to an accounting. Okay? Paul, that he, that he may not be made ashamed. All right? Our accounting for the way that we have built on the one foundation, Christ. Okay? If we haven't built on that one foundation, Christ, we can, we can expect to be ashamed. 
Now, you may be taking this to be saying that Paul's earnest expectation is that he wouldn't be in chains, you know, he wouldn't be uh, chained to a Roman guard, that he wouldn't be in prison at all, that he wouldn't be suffering affliction, that you may look at it that way. I can't do that. As I read the rest of the verse, and we've plowed through it, you know, really, well, actually, we've plowed through it slightly here. It doesn't, it doesn't seem that any of those things come up. Not my earnest expectation and hope is that I'm going to heaven. He didn't say that. Uh, my earnest uh, expectation and hope is that I'll be set free from prison. He didn't say that. And, and you know, maybe that's the problem with Christian hope today. You know, it's, it's a hope. When we think of hope, it's just, I, I hope I, I make it to heaven. It's a hope that we get to heaven, you know, and, and no more suffering, no more pain. All of our wishes granted, you know, you know, streets of gold and, you know, uh, nice pretty horses and, uh, you know, uh, you know, big fancy four-wheel drive pickup trucks, golf, if you like that, uh, you know, who, who knows what. I don't see any of those indications in this verse. His eager expectation and his hope is not that he just be in heaven to be rid of all this mess but that Christ be magnified in his body. Now, as carefully as I know how to say it, it seems to me that our hope is the person and work of the Lord Jesus Christ. That is our hope. When we went through our study in Colossians, we saw in the third chapter, the Paul's talk about when Christ who is our life shall appear, then shall ye also appear with him in glory. When Christ, who is our life, not our example, our life. We don't want to leave that out. You know, we do that and we've made our hope something other than the Lord Jesus Christ. That Christ shall be magnified in my body. What about for freedom from pain, freedom from imprisonment, freedom from starvation, freedom from cold, uh, Freedom from fear. Paul's expectation was the glorification of Jesus Christ. I want This is what I want you to see. If we don't understand the 20th verse, we don't know what verse 21 means. For me to live is Christ. I've, I've often, for many, many years, I've read, you know, every time I, I come across those words, for me to live is Christ. It just, I have to, even to this day, I have to stop and wonder why it is or how could so many Christians fail to take those words for what they mean. For me to live is doing the best I can. No. For me to live is just, Folks, listen to me. It's sometimes there's there's great truth in such in simple statements as that. Christ is our life. We, for me to live is Christ. It's not for me to live is to to be like Christ, to be the best copy cat copy of Christ. Okay, it's for me to live is Christ. Look, if if God wanted us to just all imitate, mimic, copy. Christ. Okay. Well, that's how he was. He left an example for us to follow. And so we're going to live the best the, to the best of our ability in our, and in our own strength, we're going to try to live as much like Christ as possible. Well, we don't need a resurrected Christ. He lives, folks. <laughs> no, of course, that's yeah. what well, Christian doesn't know that. Well, yeah, Steve, of course, yeah, I know he lives. I know he raised from the dead. Okay, if you know, if you understand that he raised from the dead, then you ought to, ought to understand that he's not just some standby agent of, of, uh, you know, it's kind of like he's just kind of overseer. Okay, he's like Christ, our overseer. Okay, when Christ, who is our overseer, who stands by watching us work, that's not what the text says. 
this is the point I want to stress. Okay? That Christ shall be magnified in my body. Christ manifest. Christ, not I, but Christ, as, as Paul put in Galatians. Okay? Paul's hope right here in this context, folks, was not to be free. Okay? His hope was the glorification, the magnification of the Lord Jesus Christ, no matter what his circumstances, whether he was alive, whether going to live, or whether he was going to die. Okay? For me to live is Christ and to die is gain. And that word, gain, that means a return on an investment. So that's what the Greek word means. On every page of this book of, of Philippians, or every, every page of this book of this Bible, I see the Lord Jesus Christ. I see him as he molded the creation together into earth and stars and light. I see him as he sits on his throne of judgment in the book of Revelation with all the nations gathered before him. I see him as the Redeemer, as the Creator, as, as, as the King of Israel. I see him as the majestic God that he is. Why shouldn't Christ be the one that captivates our attention and our thinking, our anticipation, not, not the satisfaction of some uh, diversion to self-will? I, I don't think I'm doing a very good, good job of getting my point across. It's, it's, it's not, there are, there are a lot of Christians who would just be content with just nothing more than just heaven when I die. Okay. That's it. You know, I don't even care about rewards. I just want heaven when I die. I really don't want to be in the situation that I'm in. I just want to go to heaven and I'm touching on a nerve here. I know, especially given the timing of this message, because we are hoping to be raptured soon. And what I'm trying to explain to you people is that we just happen to be in a passage of, of, of Scripture in Philippians, which in which the context is one in, which heavily, heavily reinforces the idea, that proposes the idea to us, that makes it crystal clear to us that it's not about a change of our present circumstances or elite, an elite, some alleviation of our suffering, you know, to be relocated repositioned from one thing one place to another or one thing to another it's it's not that's not our primary concern our primary concern is that christ will be magnified in our body that's that's our primary concern okay uh and that what that does is is it directs our thinking into an entirely different realm altogether for me to live is Christ. The word live is, is a present infinitive. For me to go on living is what the, the Greek would say. For me to go on living is Christ. Not relief from suffering. Not relief from my present circumstances that, I, that seem so un, unbearable. That's, that's what I'm reading in the, in the text. That's what I'm seeing in the text. Christ. Christ in his person, Christ in his glory, the Christ who redeemed us, who is our life. Maybe the, the problem is we don't realize the pit from which we've been digged. Maybe we don't realize what God has done for us in the person of our Lord Jesus Christ. Maybe we don't comprehend the enormity of sin as God sees it. We all... You know, every one of us are too, are, we're just all too inclined to treat sin lightly. Try and direct our own lives, complain through our wilderness journey here. Just want heaven when we die. Or, or, or perhaps we want, you know, this uh, God like some genie in a bottle. You know, I'll rescue, uh, rescue us from our presence. We don't want to suffer, Okay. So a rescue knight in white and shining armor, you know, some, just to come and rescue us, keep us in a bed of roses all the time. That's what we want. I mean, dependence upon God and difficulty and hardship and trials and sufferings and all that, all that dependence stuff, you know, is just too scary. 
And yet that's exactly what we're being shown in the text. You know, God didn't treat sin lightly. He gave Himself in our place that we might live. We were identified with Christ in His death, burial, and resurrection. I think the grand topic of glory will be the person and the work of Jesus Christ. Ask yourself the, the question, is that the grand topic of here today? I hear the Holy Spirit have Paul say in 1 Corinthians chapter 2, I determined to know nothing among you except Jesus Christ and Him crucified. Okay, well that's His person and His work. That Christ shall be magnified in my body whether I go on living or whether I die. For me, for me to live present infinitive, to go on living is Christ. Not, not the hope of freedom, not the hope of deliverance, not the hope of, of being rescued from my predicament, my relief from my sufferings or anything else, but Christ, that He would be magnified. No wonder the Holy Spirit speaks of Paul as a slave of Jesus Christ. Are, are we willing to say, God, if you want it that way, it's fine with me? You know, we so desperately want our way. Yet the predominant message today is God doesn't want you to suffer. Oh, He don't want you to suffer at all. God doesn't want you to have any pain. God doesn't want you to have any difficulty. And if you do, it's because, well, really, you've messed up your life. You've put yourself in that situation. God didn't put you there. God doesn't want you to have any pain. God doesn't want you to have any trials, any hardships. If you do, it's because you've got sin in your life. And, and we've somehow decided that what sells and what sells well is to lead people to believe that victory in Christ means an easy, even fun time here. And yet every illustration that we have in this book preaches against that idea. What we have here is a human individual in intense difficulty with an eager expectation and a hope that Christ be magnified in his body regardless of what occurs in his life and that for him to go on living is Christ. That's the way I read that verse. Since I live in the flesh, then it's quite clear to me that that's what God wants me to do. That's the fruit of my labor. Now, you can put the word my in there if you want. The Greek just says fruit of labor, not fruit of my labor. Fruit of labor. I, and I think that's, a, that's beautiful because it's, it's, it's not I but Christ. Uh, the Greek just says fruit of labor. That's why I'm in the flesh, to bear fruit. And it's not even really my work. However, as far as I'm concerned, I don't know what I'd choose because I haven't perceived that yet. Now, stop and think about that for a moment. Here we have Paul saying, I haven't even perceived what God has for me. I sit here in this prison cell. Maybe I'm going to die. Maybe I'm not. I don't know. Since I'm still alive, that's obviously the fruit of my work. That's why I'm here. That's what God is doing with me. My hope, my expectation is that Christ is going to be magnified in my body, whether I live or I die. Doesn't make any difference. This is what the Holy Spirit through Paul is telling us. I think if you, if it was you or I, it was in Paul's situation, and at at Paul's age, and in Paul's physical condition, without any question, we'd choose heaven. We wouldn't. We wouldn't have any problem making up our mind. Paul says, "I haven't even perceived yet what I would choose, because God obviously has made clear to me where the service is and what the future holds." I'd like to depart and be with Christ because Christ is my hope, my eager expectation. But my eager expectation and my hope is not heaven, okay? It is Christ. That's what I'm trying to get you to see. It's the glorification of the Lord Jesus Christ. I'm really constrained because I'd like to depart and be with Christ, which is infinitely better for me. However, to remain here in the flesh is more needful because of you.
The authorized version says, is more needful for you. The reason Paul was in the flesh, the reason you and I are in the flesh, is for each other. I realize that God working in us both the will and the do of His good pleasure. Uh, you know, it's, it's a marvelous, marvelous thing just to know, just to be able to rest in the fact that God is working in us both to will and to do of His good pleasure. And we cannot lose sight of the fact that we are the body of Christ and members of one another and that when one part suffers, we all suffer. We need one another. When one part rejoices, we all rejoice. This is what we see in the text. The reason that I'm remaining in the flesh at this present moment is because of you. Not because of me, Paul says, but because of you. Look, I love you all. I truly do. Thank you so much for everything. I, I, uh, all your comments, your messages, your, your support. Uh, just everything. Just thank you for being a part of my life and a part of this ministry and, and helping further this ministry. Uh, I don't know if we're going to, if I, there'll be another video after this or not. Uh, if there is, well, I've got some, uh, if we're still here after May 17, I've got, I'll, I'll be putting out another rapture timeline update, sort of an updated version of where we're at and where I see us going. Uh, until then, I love you all. I truly do. Rest in Him. And thanks for watching.